Happy June. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we are um, delighted to join you for the quilt's first June edition. Happy and Pride Month for those of you who celebrate that. And so, just welcome to a, a discussion of creativity and inspiration. Absolutely. We have a lot of questions that um, I've gotten from um, our social media accounts and uh, on Instagram and Facebook, but feel free to add additional questions to the chat because this is this is a big topic and a lot of people have a lot of different advice about it. Yeah, and, and as always, our goal is to share our process, our struggles, and not tell you how you should approach your creativity, but rather give you a glimpse into ours and let you kind of ponder whether there are aspects of it that, that could help you or hinder just you know it, it's about finding your own way and i think different things work for different people so and at different times yes absolutely absolutely it's, and i think i kind of want to start out <clears throat> saying that um there you can foster creativity and inspiration and i i think that there is a misunderstanding sometimes among people that think that um, you have to have some perfect experience in order to have inspiration or you have to have a beautiful photograph or you have to have, um, you have to, you know, a lot of times during COVID people have said, I can't get outside for inspiration. But inspiration can also be found in books and in memories and yeah. um, in lots of different ways. So you're not, only limited if you're right. if you can't travel or whatever you don't have to be at the Sistine Chapel in order to <laughs> no. get inspiration and and creativity can be something that is unexpected but it can also be a discipline and we'll talk about that as well yes. so so do you want to and, we, we've and got, I also want to say thank you for those of you who are here um, earlier than usual yes. because we are usually on at noon but yes. we, we had a schedule conflict in the afternoon right. so so Thank you for those yeah. of you. I, I think our Australian friends will probably not be up today. <laughs> but a little easier for the European friends. But Mary Elizabeth from Rhode Island is here. So okay. we know at least Hello. one person is here. <laughs> so um, so what, let's, let's talk. The first question we got was, um, where do we get inspiration? And it's a broad question. But I want to hear sure. your answer to this. Well, yeah, we, we we don't plan all this ahead of time, so Which we, we do a lot. Thing. We do a lot of planning, but we don't necessarily know what the other will talk about. So for me, inspiration is very much um, experiential for me. I think weeks is much more of a a reflective person in general. Uh, not with this line. Not, not, not with the fabric with the line, line we just finished, but in yeah. general, and I tend to. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a real adventurer, so I love getting out, seeing new things, meeting new people. And so inspiration for me often comes from seeing things differently in a new place or a new setting. And as Week said, that doesn't mean that, oh, I go to Morocco and I see a tile pattern I like. Right. It, it's rarely literal like that. Inspiration would be more oh, I go and spend a month in Morocco and I'm intrigued at the beauty of pattern and repetition and geometry. Or maybe color mixing too. And color mixing. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I can give a, a specific example. I lived for a couple of years when I was younger in Kenya in a rural village. And I, I still distinctly remember the first time I walked down to the market came over the hill and there were hundreds of women at the marketplace. They all had printed cloths that they would use to wrap their goods as skirts, as head wraps. And I had never seen so much pattern in one place that was not kind of coordinated. And I think that has inspired me for the rest of my life to love kind of eclectic mixes. So I've never been like, oh, I need to recreate those patterns or those colors. But 
it was inspiration to open my mind to a different way of seeing things. So what was this? It's kind of a spirit. It's a spirit. Yeah. yeah. So I, um, Monica was saying she has too many inter interruptions. We are hardwired to fiber, a fiber optic network. Oh, sorry. So um, our, on our end, it should be golden. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so sorry I, I'm they... sorry if it doesn't work on yeah. your end, but. Oh, and I, I do have to quickly say, Connie, hi. You know, Weeks and I actually met near where you yes, are in we Tennessee. We met yeah. as VISTA volunteers in yeah. Knoxville. So but back to so, your inspiration. So I said in my Craftsy class, and I, I really think that this is tr totally true, that in order for me to have inspiration, um, I need a place in our home to make things. I need a place in my uh, day, to space in the day and I need space in my head. And I find that if I've got other things that I'm anxious or stressed about, I need to take care of processing some of that before I can really, um, my best creativity comes out. And that's not, that's that's kind of a luxury I don't always have. Sometimes not, there are just deadlines. A lot deadlines. of people don't have that. Yeah, I, a lot I, of I people think, don't. I think that's, having that space in your head, in your home, and in your day, I, I think that would work for most people. I, I, I think yeah. that um, when I talk about finding inspiration, creativity in unexpected places, I think that is often because I, I do have the luxury at that time of yeah. not having a lot on my mind, perhaps. Sue is commenting on the candid struggles that I posted about last week that um, for months, you know, we've had, we've been doing fabric for 20 years and uh, this past fabric line that we just um, got uh, to Better Techs on last Friday was one that I struggled with for months. I just, yeah. it wasn't, I had, I had a lot of ideas. I just wasn't sure what direction to go. And I think, you know, it's, it, everybody faces that. And I posted about that specifically because I wanted people to understand that the creative process isn't linear and it doesn't, it's not predictable. And um, that we have things that we do to get ourselves, you know, out of the ditch as much yeah. as, as easily as possible. Yeah. But it, 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 I, I think it's just a, um, it's important for people who are struggling at home with something that they're trying to make mm -hmm. to understand that that is part of the process. It's not, it's not like you sit down and you just, that there is some correlation between the amount of time and energy you put into it and the amount of mm -hmm. output. And I, I actually That's chatted true. with Claire O'Donohue who writes a lot of quilt themed mysteries. And she, she and I were kind of commiserating about how she said, you know, one book <laughs> took her three weeks to write and another took her six years. And and we have one quilt, some quilts that have taken us, um, you know, a weekend to just like bang out because it was super clear in our heads. And then one that took well, seven years. Let's, let's give yeah. an example here. So, so let, let's see. Let's, that's the United States of Green is a great okay. one. Okay. Oh. So... Oh, oh, hello from Belgium. Hello, Belgium. Okay. Nice and early for you. And I'm just, I'm looking, actually, if you can hold this yes. a second, I'm looking at the screen, so I'm going to try to see. Uh, oh, He's going to try to screen that, share. That, that actually just went away, so I don't know. Well, I'm going to, I'll okay. talk about this while you She'll talk about it. I, I think I'll just leave it for now. Yeah, and we have it in Rediscovering Your Stash. Maybe you can figure yes. out that. But this quilt, United States of Green, and Bill is going to um, give you the whole, the big picture of it. Um, can you tilt Ooh, it so it's like, there, there we, we go. go. Um, this took seven years to finish. <laughs> and it wasn't, it, it, it was like I had, I collected greens from a lot of friends and classrooms and that kind of thing. And I had them, but I wasn't sure um what I wanted to do with it and how I knew I wanted a lot of greens in it, but I wasn't sure what form it should take and the layout and, and even just the direction conceptually of it. And, um, it 
came about, interestingly enough, um, when there started to be, I want to say in like 2015, 2016, when there started to be a lot of discussion about immigration and who were real Americans and who weren't real Americans. And I wanted to make, and then it suddenly coalesced to me in my mind that I wanted to make a quilt. I wanted all of these greens to be kind of representative of, that, of diversity. And it, so it's not United States of Green in terms of money. This is no, just, no, no, because no, a couple of people States... have asked that. No, this is oh, a, interesting. Yeah. I haven't had that question. So this is more just picking a color that represents that green is many things, just like an American is many things. Right, and it's not and so... it's not explicitly a patriotic quilt, but it's just about yeah. lots of different people mixed together, and so and that you know there's thousands of fabrics in this quilt and I really wanted it to be about celebrating diversity and you know but it took me I didn't I didn't it's so unrelated to immigration yes. <laughs> you know you don't, and, and <laughs> but it, it just for whatever reason after seven years of of really struggling with it I suddenly knew what I wanted to do and that is this is unusually long this is, for for me but, um, but but I think the other thing is sometimes you wait for something to coalesce and then a lot of details make sense. So in this case, um, I helped out later on in the process. This was really a quilt driven by weeks, but I, I helped with some of the sewing. And what we did was just sewed yardage of these strip sets. Some were oh, dark. Debbie Chen's at the birdhouse in New Buffalo. Oh. Okay, so, so uh, I just have to tell people, we 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 uh, managed to own and managed two um, Airbnbs in Southwest Michigan in their little beach cottages, <laughs> and it's crazy that one of our guests is <laughs> listening to us. Hi, Debbie. I, I hope, hope that, you love it. I hope you're having good weather. That is just that is hilarious. I, I, you I, made I'm my day. Envious. I love the birdhouse. <laughs> Clearly, the Wi-Fi at the birdhouse is good. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I love that song. Anyway. So, but back to this, the, the details that come together, once the idea that this is kind of the richness of individuals coming together, I think it also helped with the decision that there, these strips aren't cut on quarter inch increments. And no. every strip is different. It's just kind of, it's some might be three eighths, some might be five sixteenths, some might be one and an eighth. And so not only is the entire quilt rich the green unites it but every strip is unique and that that came from the this idea of celebrating diversity that it didn't have to be a predictable you know the, the constraint was that it was going to be green so then you really have a lot of wiggle room in terms of what spaces or what sizes and scale the the strips are and then you know it's a quilt so there does have to be a technical aspect to it something has to make sense it has to hold together you're still working with quarter inch seam allowances which dictates kind of the smallest strip you might do and i you know, and these were all cut with a ruler because I wanted there to be a neatness to it. Right. There, there's so much variety. And I could see someone doing this freehand, but in week, you know, weeks I talked about it and she really wanted to have structure that held mm -hmm. together this diversity so it didn't just become messy. And the vers diversity was in the color and the scale of it, but it's kind of like it's not an all or nothing. You can mm -hmm. have some structure, but it all went back to that inspiration of, of, you know, a, a seemingly unrelated thing. But I want to move on okay. so that because we've got some. So that so, so that's just kind of like one example. And, the pattern for that is in rediscovering yeah, stuff. There, there is a pattern, even though it's very improvisational within the pattern. Right, and also we kind of gave a general idea of yardage and that kind of thing. But um, uh, somebody else asked about how we organize our ideas and. Um, you know, we find that we need to have, a, we need to keep records mm -hmm. of our sketches because those ideas are just poof. You know, we get a I, phone call I, of some I have other a terrible urgency. memory. And, yeah. and we, we both are prolific in coming up with ideas, 
neither of us has the time to see them all through. They're not good ideas, though. Oh, no, no. A lot of them are bad <laughs> ideas. Let's be and clear. I, I'd say in design, over 50% of what you think of does not work, but it yeah. leads you to something else. So if, if that's frustrating to you, design might not be your thing. But, well, you have but, to kind of like wade through it. But we, we, we really keep, we keep sketchbooks and... I, we, well, I also keep computer files galore of photographs. Sometimes I take a snapshot of a sketch just so I can file it. And our computer files are pretty carefully labeled, organized, put in folders. New ideas, that kind of thing. Like when we're working on a fabric line, we have folders of unused ideas. Um, for every fabric pattern that we've we've created and that has been printed, we probably have three that haven't made the cut. But they are, there may be a basis for something good that could develop in the future. So we have which leads us which leads oh. us to reclaimed. Oh, okay. Because this was this was a pattern. Actually, if you um, hand me these... issue twelve, there, please. This was um, oh, this was also <laughs> a longer process than normal for us, um, and Bill came up with this. Sorry, um, it's big. <laughs> it is big. Okay, she's got. So let me actually. It doesn't have the flat shot. There's the flat shot of it um, up here, right there, and this is made all with grunge. There's a styled shot, and then this is. A queen size version. We did a queen size layout as well, but the, the well, Bill came up with a digital sketch of several quilts, and you can take it from well, there. Well, the the inspiration actually came from quilters like you. I I was on the road a lot teaching, and over and over in workshops, people would pull out their stashes of grunge, and. 100% of the time, it seemed, they were using it as kind of a background. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the grunge line is beautiful. There are so many good colors in it. But it was always uh, kind of the best supporting actor role. And I thought as a personal challenge, I would like to try, I would like to design a quilt that was all about the grunge. Yeah. And I had actually never seen a fully grunge quilt. I'm sure there are there are ones out there, I just hadn't seen one. And so grunge really works with the idea that it's kind of a weathered, textured look. Irregular. Irregular. Yeah. So I was looking at just kind of old barn wood. I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania with lots of barns. You always have that faded wood and the gaps are irregular. And so this quilt, I was looking at how, how planks shrink over time and they're irregular and that's why it was called reclaimed and I did I end up with one sketch I really liked that I, I always pin things up on my bulletin board and for years weeks very like she kept saying it's a good idea but it's candidly I'm, it's just yeah, too busy it's too busy yeah basically too I much. had double or triple the number of pieces yeah and there were just too many angles for me and I felt like it was a little bit too jarring. And I think that... And if, he sat on it. I sat on it. <laughs> so if I go back to this, if you can imagine, this is a four foot by six foot quilt. If you could imagine two or three times as many pieces, the problem was you lost the beauty of the color. Mm -hmm. And this has black sashing strips that are irregular. Some are a quarter inch, some are a half inch. And when it got busy, you just didn't see that. And I felt like I felt like your eye didn't know where to go because it, it was just it was too much stimulation because there were too many angles and too many shapes, and and because the gaps between it were too irregular, I, I just I just found it tiring to look at. Yeah. And, but he took that criticism. Oh and, yeah, we and, we added each yeah. other's ideas, and and it goes back to the inspiration. Like I had inspiration that was really kind of childhood growing up um spending time in old barns and and also just loving the beauty of, of wood and when weeks talked about having space in your head and your day 
I don't think I ever took the time to give that. I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of put it up there and set it aside. And I don't remember why I revisited this, but maybe you had made another comment. And years later, it kind of came together. I, yeah. I love the quilt. Um, I enjoyed making it. And I love it now. She loves I love it, it now. Yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, but I felt like it was, it needed the editing process. And this is the point of sharing this quilt and this kind of story about inspiration is to, um, to ex really encourage you to take the time to edit. That editing your ideas, it's kind of like a lot of people will think, I have this vision for the layout and if it doesn't work, then I'm done. And even just change, and, and people, I'll see people change the layout, but sometimes you need to change the scale of the block or change, eliminate. Often it's there are too many ideas. When we're teaching, typically the number one th thing I see is too many ideas in a quilt. Yeah, and I think, Karen, you mentioned that tracking ideas is the hardest part for you. This is where I think sketchbooks are really useful as opposed to like loose leaf paper because with a sketchbook if you put something down and it has too many ideas you still have captured all the ideas and you can separate them later but also uh they are you you, you can go back to it because i think for me i can track the ideas i can't always remember them we don't but need to, though. We don't need yeah. to, but if there's a sketchbook, you can pick it up and, and flip through it. And you don't have to be a great artist. A sketchbook... No, it's not a, it's not a this, painting. This it's, is, it's, it's, a, it's a recording of an idea. We, we have a joke here all the time with sketches. Sometimes they're just quick, rough sketches. And we're, we never apologize for the quality of a sketch because we joke and say, it's not going in the museum of me. No, <laughs> like, yeah, the museum of us. No, there's you know, no museum of us. No, who cares? <laughs> you know, it's just, just something that we do to get there. So, But I think sometimes when we're stuck, like I was stuck on this fabric line and there was a deadline coming and I was just didn't feel like I had anything that I wanted to pursue. I had a bunch of ideas but it's kind of like standing at the fork of like 150 roads and saying like, is there anything good down there? Is this worth my time to go down this yeah, yeah. road? And, and actually time is a luxury too, because if you can have the, dis the time to walk away from an idea and come back to it, you often see it with fresh eyes. Like this well, morning. Well, I had set it aside for oh, months. For months. Well, and, 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 you had too much time. For... No, no, I think it was just, you know, there were just still too many things in my head a month later. But it, there, it was definitely down to the wire, which is normally, normally we get our stuff in early. So yeah. it, was, it was unusual. But I, I also think it was, you know, it was saying like, I am going to walk down this road and see if there's anything. And if there isn't anything, then, uh, you know, I need to mm -hmm. just sort of uh, call it quits and take yeah. a, t get a hall pass for and, this line. And that, that editing process, one thing I do like to clarify is some people think that editing is always taking away. Editing can be reductive or additive. So with this fabric line, we were- That we can't show you. That we can't show yeah. you yet. So it's, um, Weeks had six sketches or pretty well-developed ideas, but something was missing. And it was a matter of adding one, taking away one, but also adding, there was something missing that helped unify but, it but all. But even, there, actually it went back that I had one that I was happy with and I couldn't figure out that I had another one that seemed totally unrelated that I was also happy with and I couldn't figure out what would work with either one and then making some changes they looked better together yeah. but you know somebody um, was asking about how do you choose possibilities without getting overwhelmed and in this particular case with this line um, and and also I think with United States of Green and with um, Reclaimed Sometimes taking one part, taking one part out and setting it aside and then developing another part of the design is often a really good way to go because it's kind of like, um, you know, if you're, if you're in the kitchen cooking and it's, uh, you know, seven o'clock on Thanksgiving dinner and there's pots and dishes and everything 
and you have to find something, it's a lot harder. If you can kind of clear the decks and take things out of the design to simplify it first and then add details back in, that is often one thing that is really helpful because you can start to build on one thing rather than trying to feed three different ideas in one. You know, yeah, and we're talking about this kind of macro level of design, but even if you're just sitting down with a pattern that you love, this could all apply to choosing a palette and choosing the fabrics that you want to use. Um, I don't want you to think there's some hierarchy of inspiration yeah. and creativity. There's as much creativity involved in, in the decisions you make of what quilting you do, what what pal Absolutely. you know fabrics you use, even so, binding and things so like that. So you've got another. I want to keep keep going okay. on some of these questions. So one of the really um, uh, one topic that Bill and I feel strongly about, and for us, but you can listen to our <laughs> point of view and see whether you agree or not, is the number of times I've heard people say, just put everything in a bag and then pull it out of the bag and it'll all be perfect in, in terms of color work. Color work. And I always say- And there, there are teachers who, who lead workshops yeah. where they do this. That, that... And, and, and our response is, who is the person putting the colors in the bag? So if you've got somebody who's a great colorist putting all the things in the bag, then anything you take out will look good next to each other, and that's great. But if you aren't confident with color, you may be disappointed in that process. Yeah, and so, I actually want to add a little detail because there are, there are a couple teachers who lead workshops where everyone comes and makes works on the same pattern. But the trick is that everyone has a bag, is given a bag of fabrics to work with. They and, already work together. And and it's like it's like but, the blue apron or one of those meal kits. It's yeah, like once if you but, somebody's given you all the ingredients, it'll work. But you often see in the class description about how freeing it is because you learn that everything works. And we, we just disagree. I, I, I everything doesn't just work. Things can really undermine designs, but if, if someone has made careful selections or even intuitive selections yeah. in preparing that bag of fabrics, that's one thing. I I also don't want you to think that you don't have to be like crazy obsessed over every fabric, but but one fabric that's a little too bright, wow, one fabric that that's a little too mm -hmm. dark can throw a quilt. Yeah. And um, that's why we, we do lay out most of our quilts before we start sewing absolutely and walk away from them for at least a day and and we also we also ask um anybody who's in the household even if it's our daughter or oh, you yeah. know a friend oh, she's or, blunt you know, she'll tell yeah. us <laughs> it's like could i get another set of eyes and it's uh and and we have we've had another quilt um where oh. we did not take the time Oh, okay, this is we, we this. said we we talk about some struggles. Let's yeah. talk about a, a really this um, our um, old school quilt. Uh, we had a sketch of it, so it's it was super, completely different from this original. Super simple. Actually, let me find the flat shot. It was uh, it was pieced together. Super simple. Yeah. It was pieced together in a totally different design. And because we had not taken the time. Wasn't it on point too? Yeah, it was on point. And um, we had not taken the time to get a second set of eyes. And uh, oh we just started gosh. sewing because we were in a hurry. And we got the whole thing finished. And I said, it's terrible. Oh, we, we came down the next day. And we have to rip the whole thing out. And basically we had a design concept in our heads. Well, we had an illustration. And we had an illustration, we had sketches. But when we saw it the next day, we realized what we had designed on paper didn't... You, it looked different. It, it looked the totally scale, different. At the scale of a little illustration, it looked, it looked great. It looked great. But when, it, to human scale... You couldn't see it, the it structure just, of the quilt. And and it was going to look awful in a, in a publication, like the ph photography was Well, it would also look impossible. awful on, on a bed or on a yeah, chair. Just, and so... Yeah, bad idea. The seam ripper came out, and we, we spent the next day ripping out every single piece. And, yeah. and because of that, um, 
Let me see. And this is a very, you know, it's a pretty straightforward variation of a nine patch that, but what I want to show you is on the back, there are a lot of squares on the back that were left over after we ripped we pulled, them out, out because the final quilt used far fewer. Um, I mean, the way this came to work was incorporating a lot of this. It's a navy blue and black woven gingham. It probably looks black or navy solid, but if you go up close, you might be able to see that it's actually a woven. And so the original had very little of that. And it was mostly using these reproductions, Civil War and William Morris prints, but they didn't read we had, well. and, and also, there were so many things wrong with it. And like, <laughs> so many things. So it was kind of like, I, I saw a picture the other day of that quilt that we had taken, you know, and wow. I was like, oh, holy cow. The colors were wrong. The layout was wrong. The scale was it wrong. was just a mess. But Karen's saying she doesn't understand the appeal of the bag pull and the decision decision is the best part. It's not the best part for some people though. And that's yeah, where yeah. it's the, the people who really struggle with this. Um, everybody brings different skill sets to it. And, um, and I think for a lot of people that that bag pull is kind of like a little security blanket that it's going to be, well, it's going to work. And, and then, you know, we've both had people bring those quilts to, um, you know, to a class and say, I'm not happy with this, you know, help me figure this out. And they'll say, you know, so-and-so said, all you have to do is put all of the, all the fabrics you like in a bag and pull them out and they'll all work. And, and it's like, yeah. you know, we even having two master's degrees in design and, you know, <laughs> we make 30 years mistakes. of experience and curating a palette, we totally messed up yeah. and had to pull it all apart. So <clears throat> it, it, um, you know, it just happens, but um, and, oh, Anne's and, joining us from Sweden. Oh, good. Hi. So um, but I, I do want to also say that the for you, Karen, the decisions are the best part. I think that's something that we try to keep in mind, that there are some people who love sewing, some who enjoy the cutting, some who want to do the design, some who want to do the color work. So when we're creating publications, we're trying to think, uh, you know, of, of all the different people, because for, for the, the sense of creativity, some people it's about going on a retreat with all your pieces already cut, everything planned so you don't have to think. Right. And it's restorative to kind of shut it off. For others, they love going away, taking their things with them and thinking hard about the decisions. Or asking so, everybody at the retreat, yeah. oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But I think the... It, it does go back to um, the idea that it's if if you're struggling with the design of something that is normal that is to be expected it's totally part normal. of the process and it happens to, even to people who have training Bill's a design professor <laughs> it well, happens to him yeah so, and, and I, I think it's a little different from kind of the standard quote unquote writer's block I don't think for us, we rarely have a hard time coming up with ideas. We have a hard time coming up with ideas Good that ideas. work all yeah. the time. But even the kind of uncertain ideas we hang on to. Yeah. And we try to record the missteps. Although every now and then we're going through old files, old sketchbooks, or especially old files. And I see something I'm just so mortified by because I hate yeah. it so much that I just delete it. Yeah, I, I don't do that often, but sometimes like, We just what did that with some old fabric designs. It was like, yeah. oh my goodness, get that out of here. Don't, I, don't yeah. want, I don't want anybody to ever associate <laughs> that with me. Um, so another question we had was about, and this was a common question about people who go on vacation to some place awe-inspiring, like a national park or something. And then they want to come back and capture, they say, oh, that's my inspiration. And then they want to come back and recreate that um, a quilt that captured that. captures the awe that they experienced and that is a nice memory. And this is incredibly common because who doesn't want to hold on to a wonderful memory of a vacation uh, the, the mountains, the wetlands, whatever they've experienced. 
And this is really fraught with... Well, well I, I think, it has I think tons we need to, of possibilities. Yeah, but has, I think we need to really be careful with our yeah. language here because there are people for whom this is the this is bliss yes. and they love taking a photograph and recreating it with the thread painting and, yes. and all of that and that does capture it for them oh absolutely and that satisfies that desire we have not found that that works for us that that trying to like take a photograph or do something literal captures the detail because fabric is so much less fine than the details in our memory. And so for me, like photography captures it better than, it's, it's like the medium you're choosing. We, we often have the question when, you're des when we're designing something, why is it a quilt? Mm -hmm. And in the world of art quilts, there are a lot of representational quilts that are kind of more along the lines of paintings that are done Landscape quilts either and things like fused that. or um, where you're not worrying about the technicalities of seam allowances or utility or wash and wear. Part of it comes from the fact that we, we 99% of the quilts we make are functional and washable. But when going back to that idea of capturing a memory, we often like to do that too. And we just don't do it in the literal, figurative, realistic sense. So we have a quilt that was an Isn't example it? of this. Yeah, that... Or a cut, sir. No, that, that's, that's okay. good. <clears throat> so if you saw this quilt, this is called, well, before I even say what it is, it, it's really fun color work, and it looks very kind of straightforward, strips but it actually it's called white caps and um thinking of new buffalo michigan <laughs> this thinking, came this is where she is oh actually that's that's <laughs> this the, is taken the, this the is deck. taken in new buffalo on the deck where debbie chen is sitting right now which yes. is kind of hilarious <laughs> so the idea is the the lake michigan is something that neither of us grew up with right. you know, we're, we're east coasters but we've been here um, for a couple decades now in the Midwest, and Lake Michigan is pretty amazing. When you're on it, you feel like you're at the ocean because you don't see across it. Some places, it looks Caribbean blue in mm -hmm. certain lights. Other places, it kind of gets a beautiful muddy green, but the winds come across the lake and you often have white caps. And so we were trying to capture kind of the beauty of the color and the boldness and of, the, of, of, of the, the boldness of the lake when you see those white caps coming in and then like there's a red flag that they put up at the beach saying like you can't go in because the tide is so strong and i think i wanted to see that boldness of and, the lake and so the little bits of white so this is a represent, you know, non-representational. It's an abstraction of how those white caps are just a tiny part, a little bit in terms of the proportion. And, and that this is navy. This, uh, yeah, that's not it black. looks black, but it's, it, it's a I, deep. It, it's just the camera, but, the way that. But, but if you look things. at all these colors, you'll see some of them are really murky and muddy, mm -hmm. and some are very clear. And it's mixed up because um, we were over the weekend, we were in the up on the dunes looking down at the lake. And if you look 200 yards out, the lake is five different colors, depending on whether it's over a low sandbar or it's a deep place or where the currents are coming. And it's not one color, it's many, many colors. So for us, this was capturing kind of the noise, the energy. Even a detail, like if you look, there's no border, this is the binding, that this could go on and on. The lake just mm -hmm. is huge. It's expansive. It's a, yeah, expansive. And we did, and we have a, you know, we did our wave pattern on there because it was so, oh, just it was a so, very simple wave quilting. But I, I do want to get, um, answer a couple questions. Um, the question about, is the final result far away from what you thought it might be? 
yes and no. Sometimes it is re like um, we thought this through um, white caps so much that it was exactly what we wanted. The reclaimed quilt um, started out so differently as did United States of Green. So that is part of the design process that sometimes Sometimes it's like a map in your head. Like for me, the, our dreamy fabric line and our um, lavish quilt were exactly what I thought that they would be. But then there are others that just take you in a different direction. And I think part of, and I, I learned this in, in graduate school from one of my professors who said, you have to let your babies go. Like sometimes, sometimes you have to let certain ideas sit on the sidelines while you pursue something else. And they will and, develop and allow, into something else over time. Yeah, you can come revisit but, them. But it's okay to to go in another direction that you totally had not planned on. And that, that's what happened with this fabric line is I allowed myself as, mm -hmm. as I was developing the patterns to not have to do it very intuitively because I couldn't come up with a concept that, that I built from. I thought I'm just going to just draw and draw and draw until you know, I have to go to sleep and then I'm going to do it again the next day mm -hmm. and and then allow that. And so sometimes it's very sort of, it's it's an intense, an intentional process where you have an idea and you're trying to build on it. And sometimes it's just what Twyla, Twyla Tharp prefers to is chicken scratching, where you're just, you're just scratching around in the dirt looking for grain. Yeah, and, and you will usually find something, but it may take longer than you think. Yeah, and it can and it can it can mess with your head mm -hmm. <laughs> and your confidence while you're doing that. But and anyway, I, 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 yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm one of those who oh. goes to retreats with fabrics cut up in patterns. Yes, I know. I could, <laughs> it's like okay, I, wait, wait, I don't I, go I to. Take, can you finish retreats. reading that because I know when yeah. we have it on YouTube, people oh, okay. don't see the comments. I am one of those that goes to retreats with fabrics cut and patterns decided on because there's too much noise and I can't concentrate. I personally need quiet for creativity. Okay, yes. Lisa. Yes, that's... And it's funny because I used to always say that you need two knitting projects as well. One where you can sit around with other people or handwork or whatever, and then one where you're lock, you know, you're locking yourself mm -hmm. in a quiet room, and God forbid somebody tries <laughs> to call you because you're counting mm -hmm. stitches. And it's the same thing with quilting. That I think you're absolutely right. You have to have the mindless. At least I have to have the mindless sewing if I'm going to be around other people. And Lisa, I actually, the other thing I've noticed when I've been at retreats with people that can be a challenge is, and you probably re have experienced this, everyone has an opinion. So if you're yeah. working on a project, <laughs> people will come and kind of unsolicited yes, play advice. Play the fly, fly away. <laughs> and sometimes having something decided ahead of time is yeah. really, really useful. Yeah. Um, it's well-intentioned. Always. Very, always well-intentioned. And well it's intentioned. excitement. Usually it's based on excitement and for your idea. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, Weeks was talking earlier that I'm a design professor. It's one of the things I work with my students all the time. When we have critiques, every single student in the classroom will speak up when if, let's say, Jill posts, you know, her design on the wall and she gets 10 uh, different kinds of feedback from her classmates. And I always have to say, now the hard part is you have to sort through that because it's your project, not theirs. And their critiques are all well-intentioned because they're excited about what you're doing and they yeah. kind of want to take it over. Yeah. But it's your project, not theirs. And oh, so, you're a fun one to oh, be I, talking I, about. I, I'm terrible because I take over ideas. All, I'm really bad at that. I Weeks mentioned something. I get all excited. and our, 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 the, famous, the famous story was I <laughs> said one day, uh, 10, 12 years ago, I want to design a quilt called Still Life with Pears. And then I went to the grocery store and I came back and there was a, there was a, a pattern was already oh written. <laughs> I, I just, I, 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 admit, just I took like, it over. Wait a minute. We hadn't even discussed it. It was just, I got no, excited by no. the idea and, and, and I just <laughs> saw it so clearly. And it actually ended up being on the cover of our first our issue. Our first issue, yes. But and, so I think Patricia's saying like the, she's quoting like, 
Bill's statement about why is it a quilt, that this is a good way to approach the vacation inspiration question. And, and so I think for those of you who are planning trips and mm -hmm. getting out this summer, one of the things that I hope you'll be able to take with you is a plan for like it, how you might want to capture this. Maybe it's a series of blocks that all reinterpret it or, you know, there's or a lot color of, palette that... or pa color palette. Exactly. And if you have like a swatch card of solids you can take with you or, uh, you know, you can get good photography to reproduce those colors later. But give yourself a wide parameter of ways to interpret that inspiration. Mm -hmm. Don't think it has to be a literal representation of exactly what you saw. Yeah. It can just be really open to a wide range of expressions yeah. of, of, of that. And I, I don't know if we've mentioned it before, but I think back to many years ago, we had a commission, a uh, wealthy uh, homeowner had his interior designer fly into our studio from LA and she was working on an, a pretty incredible home in, was it Missouri? Was it Missouri? In Missouri. She made 18 queen and king size quilts we were and making. We were making custom quilts and they were actually quite simple, the quilts. And the, the owner and the designer really wanted this whole home to feel like the woods it was in, to feel calm, to have a, you know, it was, it was about a vibe. Mm -hmm. And she showed up and opened up boxes that had stones, tree bark, lichen, leaves from acorns, the property, acorns. Sticks, yeah. And the directive wasn't here, match these colors, but you know, this is what the place feels like. And can you, all of the rooms, had all cherry furniture, the wood, the windows were trimmed in cherry. It was all natural materials. And so that was the directive. And, and seeing that, we kept the quilts quite, quite simple. Some of them were whole cloth quilts. Some only had three different pieces. But basically it was the whole idea was this kind of minimalist um, design approach for these it was 17, right? I think, I think 17. Every, and every room was different. Every room was different. And they had, there were some rugs and that kind of thing as well. But for the most part, the whole goal was to work with this palette of nature because they were going to be there in the winter. And, and so um, uh, they wanted the colors on the inside to match the colors on the outside and kind of reflect that nature. So it was that, a great is, that is, a, but that is a really great um, example of how you don't need to thread paint all of the trees on a wall hanging. Exactly. You know, th that there's a range from from what we did, which was look at the colors that that the interior designer provided, all the way to the literal taking a photograph and, you know, or, little by little uh, doing a landscape quilt. There's a lot of range for expression between those two right. extremes. And, and th there can be beauty on all the extremes. I don't know, I can't, I'm blanking on uh, the artist's name, just the beautiful quilt that was done for Art Prize uh, maybe a decade ago that won the People's Choice Award at Art Prize in Grand Rapids, it was just the enormous landscape quilt that was all applique and I think fused, but it was a literal kind of reproduction of a forest view and just incredible, incredible work, but it it's a different approach to something. And that approach, I think for that particular- And the scale. It, I was gonna say, because the scale was so huge of the quilt, I think what's hard for me about sometimes like the national parks, the Yosemite quilt, the Grand Canyon quilt, is that it's hard to take that, that those experiences are about vastness. And then when you put it into a 30 by 40 quilt, it doesn't seem to capture the vastness of it. Mm -hmm. So um, um, there was a comment about getting inspiration from music. And yes, that, I think that is a wonderful um, source of inspiration and what colors 
are you getting from that music? That's and like a, that's a whole class to me. What Look colors are you getting fantastic. and what rhythms are you getting? I actually, I was going on a retreat somewhere that, and Weeks gave me a bundle of cherry wood hand dyes. Oh yeah. And said, here, this oh, is Oh, you were going little, to Mackinac. Where you're I, teaching, I, yeah, the, 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 uh, was it? I, yeah, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, you were going to Mackinac. She said, if you have time and you want to make something, here are some beautiful fabrics. It was a very nice gift. And I actually did that piece was all kind of music. And I was doing blocks that were all about rhythms. And I don't think anyone who would look at the quilt would know that no. or care but about that. But it doesn't that. matter. But you know? it led to kind of punctuations and syncopations of color and proportion that was visually pleasing. And, and I, I often say, uh, in some cases, people want you to be able to look at their quilt and understand what the inspiration was. We rarely feel that way. Yeah. We just want a nice quilt at the end. It's like, just like I was saying with the white caps, I don't think anyone's going to be like, oh, they were just in Lake Michigan. Yeah. You know, that, that's not. So I wanted okay. to get another um, question about somebody who was struggling with ideas, <clears throat> with the fabrics oh. and colors that are in fashion right now. And, um, that is uh, a great, uh, understandable that you, yes. he, and what I would suggest you do is maybe look at either solid solids, it can be good, or play with combinations of, of fabrics that might make the fabrics look different. But there are some quilt lines out there that, that I think I find I struggle to to get inspiration with. I'm gonna grab one other quilt. Oh, okay. And can you- Oh, and Barb, thank yeah. you for the name, Anne. That's exactly it. It's so nice having people who have better memories than I do <laughs> listening. And this this whole idea of inspiration in place and abstraction is, uh, you know, Kimberly, when you say that you're drawn to abstract art but have trouble moving those ideas to quilting ideas, I, I would say embrace the struggle. It's not easy. And sometimes if you do see a pattern for a quilt that is somewhat abstract, sometimes just following a pattern and rather than just measuring the pieces, cutting them and putting together to, to copy the pattern, if you ask yourself, like, why do you think these choices were made? Or maybe you tweak a little proportion and see the effects. I, I think you can learn through trial and error. Um, I think back to some like writing classes, creative writing classes, where the assignment might be write a chapter in the style of Ernest Hemingway. And some people are like, why are we doing this? Ernest Hemingway already wrote great books. And the idea is that by through copying and, and reflecting on those choices, you understand the decisions and in theory become a better writer. So that that's kind of part of my advice. Oh, and she, we, she's excited we were, to talk about something. We were not invited <clears throat> to ever spend a night under the quilts. No. <laughs> oh, I didn't see <laughs> that. There was a question. But this is another way to think about uh, vacation quilts. This oh. is uh, called Intrepid Traveler. And this is um, uh, Indian, Indonesian, Japanese, a variety of fabrics collected from um, other cultures that would also be a fun way. I know we had, a, remember we had a student who did this with all the Liberty fabrics that yeah. she had gotten from her travels to London. And, and uh, this quilt, actually, I, I do want to talk though about the design because this is inspiration. The inspiration was, uh, came from these fabrics which, you know, our stash is nicely organized, but most of these fabrics, we had kind of had them mixed up in the browns were with the browns, the blues were with the blues, but we realized what they had in common was irregularity. <laughs> oh, 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 UPS is here. <laughs> our, our dog says hi to UPS. So they all had irregular either block prints or they were ECATs that were woven with irregularities. And by pulling out the most saturated ones, so there was kind of a, a palette that was cohesive, but also, again, if I, you look at them, they all have a slight irregularity and kind of a handmade nature to them. It unified them, but then 
when we design the block, it's basically a square that's cut into two trapezoids. And having this little sliver helps unify everything that's so different. And I know there are a lot of people that make quilts from, they go on a shop hop and they collect fabrics. This is a good way to unify a lot of fabrics. Or if you have, you know, I know people who every single year go to the same kind of beach town or they have a, a favorite drive that they do to a quilt shop and taking that palette, taking that bundle and finding a format for it. Yeah. So again, this doesn't, it's not a map of Asia. It's right, not, right, you know, right. But, okay. So, um, Kim says that she, Kimberly, says she is drawn to... Oh, yeah, I was just talking oh, about oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you, de you dealt with that. Okay, while well, I was looking for Intrepid Traveler. And Intrepid Traveler is also in Rediscovering Your Stash because we put it in there because we realize so many people do have... Um, the, even if it's like, I've seen like the Cape Cod fabrics and, yeah. you know, themed kind of novelty prints, it's also yeah. a good one for. And it's also very scalable because it's just a square. So... Um, Oh, and then the last question. Oh, um, sure. Because this also goes back Actually, to... Actually, you... Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, and I think you have the issue under you. Okay. So... Um, this was also a vacation quilt of sorts um, from my travels to... Um, it's a royal property in Japan yeah, I called can't see it. Katsura. Can you see it? <laughs> yes. And... Uh, in the details, these checkerboards were um, found in, uh, there was, you probably, you may have seen um, a detail of the gardens in Katsura that where there's a gravel and grass checkerboard within the garden. So um, I'm actually going to show the photo. Do you see? Whoops. But also in the interior design of the space, um, there are also... Um, checkerboard motifs in oh, the tea house in the there. tea house is part of it on the shoji like on the um the credenzas inside the tea room and so i wanted to play with those that scale of seeing all of these checkerboards in different places at different scales and how they're teeny tiny when they're on um they're kind of painted on the credenza but in, you know, they're big and chunky when they're in the garden. The stepping so, stones. Yeah. And um, actually, they weren't stepping stones. It was just oh. kind of a part of the garden. Yeah. Okay. And and so, well. So the idea was that we were playing with the scale and there are these big chunky checkerboards here. And then let's see if we can, maybe it's on the other side. The little guy. Yes. Okay. And then there are some, <laughs> some little ones as well. So there we go. Yeah. So then some of them were teeny tiny and some of them were really big. So this is another way to approach the, you know, abstract design is playing with scale and um, playing, taking one motif and sizing it up and down. And it's just kind of an exercise for you to be able to think about um, a motif or a pattern in a, another way because it, it seems very static when something is at one scale, but when you change it to a smaller scale and put it next to something else, the same thing, but just scaled up or down, it can look really, mm -hmm. it can really look really different. So, so <laughs> we are going to, um, oh, oh, our, our dog is telling us. Do you want to show the palette? Oh, oh yes, 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 we forgot. <laughs> Oh my gosh, good memory. So, the June palette of the month is... Yeah. For those of you who might be new to... Yes, we have a palette every month. Of solids. And this is called Buttercup. And um, we have it on our website right now. And it's these are all kind of limited time only palettes made from Benetech Superior Solids. The... Um, I'm going to go uh, check on yes. just a moment. The pattern for the uh, checkerboard <laughs> is the Katsura quilt, and that is an issue 10 of Modern Quilts Illustrated. And um, we hope this sweet buttercup uh, palette reminds you, apparently I asked our daughter whether when she was little, they would put buttercups under their chins to, um, as, as we did at children, she said, no, we don't, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> But I know I did as a child, and I have like fond memories of 
lounging around at this time of the year in the grass uh, looking for buttercups. So the buttercup palette is um, a fun one to play with if and you it's very uh, are looking for. I think what's also nice about this is that we have had a lot of uh, kind of girlier patterns and I think what's nice is that this isn't as quite as feminine um, and oh, I, could be what you think no I don't I, I haven't thought the others I know you do. I, know I, you I, don't, I don't think that but way, a lot but, of men would okay a but lot this, of men would. it's a really what, what I like about this palette also is the way this goldenrod mm -hmm. if you look the goldenrod and um oh I'm trying to remember the, the shamrock yeah, yeah. just a second at the bottom are actually quite dark you know this all looks light but there's a lot of variation within this from kind of medium to light and so that, that's nice yeah, you and you need to and, and actually this is one of those colors that used to be really despised but is now the big hip color oh out. yeah talking so about the popular ochre, yeah. yeah so this is uh you know colors come and go in in popularity but but what we try to do is show you how you can use Color any color in, anytime yeah in, a, in the right context so buttercup is on the website so, so we will see you in july and um as always uh let us know if you have any topics you want to discuss and uh yeah and it, i'll get this up on youtube later because i know uh, there are a lot of people who couldn't join us at this earlier time today but i think next month we haven't looked ahead but yes they'll probably be back at noon next month but I'm yeah not sure. well that'll be fourth of july weekend so we'll have we'll so, figure it out yeah we'll we'll see you then but anyway yeah. have a great month take care everyone